have gone places through books that I could never go to, and I've met people through books that I will never meet. And I had, was blessed with a mom who loved to read, and I remember learning to read. My mother would bundle my sister and I up in our winter coats and take us to the barn in the winter, because we didn't have a hired man and grew up on a dairy farm. And so I learned to read in a wooden trough in a barn. Sounds a little hokey, but it's exactly what happened. Mom would bring a bag of books, and one of Mom's duties was to feed the milk to the baby calves. So she would have to wait for my father to milk the cows to get the milk to feed the calves. So meanwhile, my sister and I were just tiny, we were in the trough, and she'd take a book out and start to read to us. And then when the milk was ready, it had to stay warm for the calves, she'd put the books down and off she went. And I remember staring at those books, hoping those words would just jump off the page. And somehow I could learn to read right away because it was just magical. She would take us places with these stories, and mom was quite a storyteller as well. So I grew up loving to read and couldn't wait to learn to read so I could immerse myself in some of the great literature that we have in Canada and around the world. So it's just so nice to see books. It's hard to imagine, though, when you look at books, that some people find them intimidating. Some people perhaps could read the cover or read through a book quickly, but not really understand what's going on. So we're here today to make sure that that changes. And we're going to hear some very powerful stories as the evening goes on. PGI's for Literacy was founded by the late Peter Zosky of CBC's Radio Morningside. Starting with Peter's commitment in the late 1980s to raise one million for literacy across Canada, today there are PGI's in every province and territory. The PGI began in Nova Scotia as a golf tournament in 1991, and the last tournament was held in Cape Breton in 2017. Over that time, NSPGI has raised over $1.5 million to support literacy initiatives across this province. This is our first annual gala dinner and auction. And there are people that have been hard at work. You're going to hear who they are and what they've been doing. But it's quite amazing to see such a beautiful room filled with all these generous people. We're very grateful for the support from national and local supporters, prize donors, volunteers, and of course, you. Peter Zosky was a passionate advocate for literacy, and you're keeping his dream alive through the PGIs. My father, some of you would know, was involved in uh, public life. He was very committed to the Dartmouth Learning Network, which has truly been one of the great historical associations in this province for um, enabling people to read. Uh, in 1991, he did bring the Peter Zosky tournaments to Nova Scotia. He was the mayor of Dartmouth. It was actually my mother who read an article in Chatelaine about them and said, John, you've got to bring that tournament to, uh, to Dartmouth. And the first one was at uh, Brightwood, um, and he held them, uh, and he supported them for a number of years, and Sherry was the perennial poet laureate for the uh, Peter Zosky tournaments. So my father, even at a time when he was a premier, and at times were tough, he invested in literacy programs, and I think to his great credit, he stuck with that. Now, the real hero in the family was my mother, and what she did, to promote literacy was really quite amazing. She started delivering library books to shut-ins through the Dartmouth library system um, sometime in the 1970s. And on um, hell or high water, she delivered those books. When my father became mayor, the library said, I'm sure you're too busy, you don't. She said, no, I'll keep doing it. He became premier, she kept doing these library books. She was an amazing woman who believed that if you could read, and if you did read, and if you loved reading, life was easy. So, as a member of Parliament, I remember campaigning on literacy issues on a number of occasions when programs were being threatened or being cut. And I remember one time a, a learner came to see me when I was a member of Parliament. He came from uh, the Valley, he sat in my office and he said, Mr. Savage, I work at a plant. I don't make a lot of money, but I'm proud of my work and I like it. And I was offered a job, a promotion, which I was very excited about until they told me I had to take a test. He said, I was afraid that they would find out that I couldn't read and write. And I was afraid I'd lose the job I have now. So he said, I stuck my hand up and I became a learner. And he said, it changed my life. And he said, I want everybody to have that opportunity. And that is really the story for very, very many people. For too many of our citizens, they don't have the literacy skills that they need to succeed. As many of you know, our literacy levels fall way below the level that a country like ours should have. Literacy Nova Scotia is awesome and do tremendous work with limited resources to help learners achieve their potential by upgrading their reading skills. I thank you all. I thank you all and I offer my sincere congratulations to 
all the award winners tonight. I thank you for the hard work that you've put in. Uh, I want to acknowledge my dear friend uh, Al McPhee, Al and Mary, who've done stories I'm sure we'll hear about tonight when I think about the work that they've done to help connect people to learn. It is an extraordinary story. To all of you, thank you for being here tonight. Enjoy the evening. Thank you for supporting Literacy Nova Scotia and the PGIs. But on behalf of Lockheed Martin Canada, I'm thrilled to be here. With over 250 employees in the area, the Halifax Regional Municipality represents our largest population across Canada. We've found tremendous support and advocacy here in Nova Scotia. It gives us a great, great pleasure to be able to give back to this community by supporting the NSPGI for Literacy Gala. Thank you very much. Um, I am here on behalf of our Premier, uh, Stephen McNeil, who sends his regrets, but uh, as a government, we recognize the importance of literacy at all levels. So that's from childhood to adulthood. And we've committed to promoting and partnering with organizations such as Literacy Nova Scotia in order to uh, continue to do as much great work as possible. Even if I live 20 miles out of town, it doesn't stop me. I usually hitchhike into the class in bad weather and get in on time. My teachers thought that was really good for me. Sometimes it's funny that I also, on time, and some students just live down the street from the classroom or off on late. My instructors and teachers on the color both the extra miles and to help me out. They want me to see their life. I'm glad I met many of people on color. They are great friends. I spent most of the morning teach, uh, with my girlfriend and her lovely eight-year-old daughter, Olivia, teaching them the very basics how to ski. And I've been skiing in over 17 years, so <laughs> it was good just to get them on and off the skis and down the hill. Well, we had registered for a lesson, uh, and it was time for a break. While we were sitting down at the picnic table, we were reassuring a very frustrated young girl. And while we were doing that, another young girl sat down across from us and overheard the conversation. She too began to reassure Olivia that she could do it. That if this young girl could do it, so could she. And if that's as far as it went, I would have been impressed. But it's what she said after with a smile and a giggle. She said, I'm completely blind and I've learned to ski. Now I saw her and her chaperone with the vest and the yellow stripe saying visually impaired. It was shocked even me to see, to hear that she was completely blind. And not many people here would know this story holds special meaning to me because I was visually impaired as a child as well. Multiple, not nearly as much as this young girl, but it was enough to cause major headaches, migraines, miss a lot of time. Over many years and three surgeries, it corrected nearly all the problems. Thank you very much. It was a great honor and uh, continue on the good work. Thank you. $500. So can we get $500 for a brand new set of Okay, everybody wants that. There's $600 for a set of knives. Six we got. Seven do we have. Seven we've got. Eight we've got. You've got tires, sir, but I'm coming after you. <laughs> We're looking for $800 for a wonderful set of tires. $800, and yes, all four tires will be the same size. We've got dollars, our first four-figure prize. Thousand we've got, we have $1,100 for tires. $1,100 for tires, $1,100 for tires. We've got $1,000, we've got $1,000 over here. And it's still not, you want to go to $1,100 just for fun? No. no. <laughs> we've got $1,200, $1,200 in the room. $1,200 we've got, we have a little bit of an action. $1,300, sir? $1,300 we've got, we have $1,400, sir? I'll let you know where you live. <laughs> 1400 we got, 50. here we go, we're at 1600 I'll go once, 1600 sold. So thank you very much. I'm going to tell you now that it'll just a small story. Literacy is a really big thing for me, and uh, I, you know, I'm not uh, the most literate person. Um, I, can, I just want to tell you a little story about going to uh, Grandparents' Day last year at the, my grandkids' school, and my grandson is nine, and uh, they're playing Scrabble. So I sat down with the kids, the two nine-year-olds, to play Scrabble, and I couldn't believe the way they're spelling these words and coming up with them. Anyway, they hit, a, they hit one they couldn't figure out, and I said, I can do that, Daddy-O. So I put Daddy-O in, and they looked at each other, and they weren't sure anyway, they went on. Didn't the teacher come by and look down and she said, 
Daddy-o, that's not a word. So <laughs> I was outed by a grade four teacher and the two boys were terrified. <laughs> Your support allows the team of Learcy Nova Scotia to continue providing support to learners, to their practitioners, and to the organizations which provide the learning programs. We're passionate about what we do because we see the impact on individuals, their families, workplaces, and communities, as you have heard tonight through the stories of James and Michael. To give you a sense of what we do and how your support can contribute, I'll share with you some highlights from the past year. So 43 adult learners received financial supports totaling $10,175. We provided training to over 200 practitioners to ensure that they have the skills needed to support the learners in reaching their own learning goals. We provided IT resources including computers, laptops and iPads to 17 community-based learning organizations for use in the classroom. We provided almost 50,000 in grants to organizations to support their learning programs for over 1,000 learners. These grants can help reduce barriers for attending classes, such as transportation and childcare. It provides learning resources, nutritious meals, and enhanced learning opportunities, such as field trips. We offered six writing workshops for 74 learners and we provided a mentor training in LES, which is Literacy and Essential Skills Training, within the fisheries sector as a small pilot project, which was, has resulted in seven former clients of the Department of Community Services now being fully employed in the municipality of Barrington, and that was over a six-week period. It was a huge success. And we celebrate learner successes and promote their successes to others who could benefit from a learning program. 30 learners were showcased at a learner celebration in the Valley this fall, and 15 learner stories were featured in the Learning Beacon, an online interactive magazine that we produce. We're a nonprofit, charitable organization, and without your support, we would not be able to do what we do. Thank you so much. I want to talk about Peter, and I first want to thank Jane because she said, they couldn't do it without all of you, but um, we couldn't do it without Jane, who has worked tirelessly. So I, really so I did, they asked me to talk a little about Peter because, you know what, sometimes younger people um, who maybe came after Peter was um, gone from Morningside and um, gone from the planet um, might not know who he was, and I did have the great honor of being his friend. When Peter died, um, I had the honor of being asked to write a memorial poem for him. It's called, We Are Sorry for Our Loss. So now we can't tune in to hear the stutter stammer of your rumpled voice, a voice that erased the static of down lines, connections lost, that voice that hugged us in and hushed the racket and the rattle of ourselves inside our separate shells. We are sorry for our loss. Now we have no excuse to linger over coffee with you, but must get on with all our days, hang out that laundry, finish up the vacuuming, make notes for tomorrow's negotiations, pound more nails, pick up another fare before our shift is through, grow the oregano, herd the sheep, pile that anook shook, take off for outer space. We are sorry for the loss of all those words that no voice will ever sing the same. Before you said them, only words, black dots on a piece of paper, afterwards connected dots, in a zigzag puzzle, the magnificent enigma of a people and a place. Without being there, you took us there. We smell that cod by God, tasted those worms, traced the scars of some brave survivor, heard the song inside the singer's heart, held our breath as someone told us how she finally learned to read. 